Center, and it's my great pleasure to be able to uh, hear from Chelsea Clark today. Um, Chelsea is uh, many things, naturalist, artist. Uh, she has her um, bachelor's in fine arts from the Maine College of Art, and uh, more recently got her uh, master's degree in um, botany from the University of Vermont's Field Naturalist Program and is um, one of these rare souls who can communicate both through arts and through science. Uh, and so those are the sorts of people I like to try to surround myself with, and I hope that you feel the same way uh, already. And if not, I hope you feel the same way by the end of the, the talk tonight. Uh, Chelsea um, joins us uh, having taken a, uh, been the artist in residence on a uh, scientific research expedition up in the Arctic. And um, and I, for one, didn't know that scientific research expeditions often had artists in residence. Um, and so since I learned about that, oh, I don't know, two or three years ago from you, Chelsea, I've been dying to learn more about the story. Um, so um, I'll also mention here that uh, Chelsea's website, chelseaclark.com, is a great place to go and visit and check out her work. She does printmaking. She's a fiber artist. She has all sorts of wonderful kind of biologically themed um, artwork and all sorts of different media, and and I, I um, I'm looking forward to ordering something from you, Chelsea, for Christmas. I think, um, and oh, and also the uh, the voyage that we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, you can check out more information about that at arcticspring.org. Arcticspring.org. So I'll put those two links in the chat bar here. Um, if you have questions as we go, feel free to add your questions into the chat bar and I will um, respectfully interrupt Chelsea as we go and, and ask questions and we can also do a little Q&A at the end as well. So uh, with that, Chelsea, thank you very much for joining us and we look forward to it. Yeah, thanks for having me. So yeah, scientific research cruises don't always have an artist in residence. They probably more often than not don't, but I got this amazing opportunity in 2014, I was living in Massachusetts and I connected with Dr. Bob Pickart at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Woods Hole and he was building an outreach team for his next cruise and we talked and had this meeting where he asked me to bring any questions and I brought a written list of 39 questions which he found really amusing but he answered them all and I said I'm in. I had never been to sea before but I couldn't pass up the chance to go to the Arctic. So I thought I would start okay. by just kind of bringing you into the place. So we went in and out of Dutch Harbor, which is a tiny, tiny fishing port and Coast Guard base in the Aleutian Islands. And it is where Sean pointed out when I told him this, it's where um, Deadliest Catch is filmed. So that's kind of the kind of town it is if you've seen that show. Um, the way you, so we flew into Anchorage. I flew from Boston to Anchorage and then fly in a tiny plane to Dutch Harbor. They make you walk across a scale to get on the plane to add up how much all the people on this tiny plane weigh. And if the people weigh too much, they throw the luggage out of the plane and don't tell you until you get to Dutch Harbor. So that's what happened to us. And flying into Dutch Harbor is a little bit terrifying because you're coming down like right between the mountains onto this tiny airfield that's just surrounded by mountains. And then you just get out and walk into the smallest airport ever. So that's what happened. And then because they had thrown our luggage out of the plane because we weighed too much, we got to spend an extra several days in Dutch Harbor exploring while we waited for the luggage to come much later on a cargo plane. So I got to do some hiking and it's just this very crazy place. It's a Coast Guard base, it's a fishing port, it's a native town, um, and it's just in this tiny bay hemmed in by the mountains and there really are no trees to speak of on the island. It's very frontier-like, like a lot of the, oops, sorry. Um, a lot of the buildings are like shipping containers and it never gets dark in the summer. So this was probably like 11 p.m. in May and that's really about as dark as it gets. You can see the moon. So that was just that was kind of a cool experience spending time in Dutch Harbor. 
And then we left Dutch Harbor. And when we left, we didn't see land again for six weeks. Um, no resupply, no real contact with the outside world other than email. Um, so it was, it was pretty remote. And the ship that we were on was the US Coast Guard Cutter Healy, which is a Coast Guard icebreaker that's dedicated totally to polar science. Um, it's huge. It's 420 feet long. It can break through extremely thick ice. This is like the flagship icebreaker of the United States. And the crew is active Coast Guard. It's partly a training ship. So there are a lot of recent graduates of the Coast Guard Academy in New London are on there. So that was another really interesting sort of side experience of this whole thing was being on a Coast Guard ship. Um, it can carry 140 people. So when and when I was on it, there were about 90 crew and 50 science passengers, and that was full capacity. It was fairly crowded. Um, and it's just huge. It has labs, it has a gym, it has a laundromat, it has this giant mess hall inside. And besides the Coast Guard crew, the science was science party was mainly in three groups from Stanford, from Woods Hole Oceanographic, which was the part that I was part of, and from the Army Corps of Engineers Cold Regions Research and Engineering Lab in Hanover, New Hampshire, which is, I think, kind of loosely associated with Dartmouth. There were some Dartmouth College grad students that were with that Cold Regions group. And this is a picture of the whole, everybody except for the bare minimum number of people that had to stay on the ship to keep things functioning. So you can kind of see some of them peeking out. Um, and that's me in the green jacket because I just couldn't blend in apparently. Um, and so where we went when we left, Dutch, so Dutch Harbor is down here in the Aleutians. We left Dutch Harbor, went through the Bering Sea, through the Bering Strait, and up into the Chukchi Sea, which was, this was the main research area of the cruise. So kind of remember this coastline for the next slide because it zooms way in so that you can orient, uh, but this is like the space that's in the next map. So this here is that same piece of coastline on kind of the top of Alaska, and this is a Russian island. So once we got through the Bering Strait and we were in the Chukchi Sea, we did this crazy pattern of kind of zigzagging back and forth, trying to cover a lot of ground. So for, and it took us about three days to get up there and three days to get back at the end. So for about five weeks, we were just kind of zigzagging around, um, moving very slowly because of the ice. So the Healy can break ice at a maximum speed of three knots an hour, which is pretty slow. And we were stopping every four hours around the clock to lower instruments over the side and take um, samples. And then once every day, we would stop for a four hour ice station where people would get out on the ice and take, um, take measurements and samples. And then at one point, we stopped for four days at one ice flow to get some really long-term data in one place. Um, so I just wanted to, before I go too deep into the science, to kind of talk a little bit about what it's like to be out on the ice like that. Um, and this is my roommate, Amanda, just so you know. So we went through the Bering Sea and after the Bering Strait was when we started to get into the ice and at first it was just like little pieces and getting more ice and more ice and then eventually got into the real Arctic sea ice sheet where it's just this is all you see in every direction is just ice and one thing that I had imagined before I came was that it would just be like a fresh snow here where it's just flat glary fresh snow covered white ice but actually there was a lot of topography in the ice there are all these ridges and like pieces that have gotten heaved up they're called pressure ridges from plates of ice like basically plate tectonics plates of ice colliding and pushing up these ridges and so there's like dirty ice that's come up from underneath and it's it's very rubbly looking it's not this pristine flat white sheet at all in most pieces or most places so that was kind of a cool 
thing to discover. And these look like from the ship, they look small, like maybe you could step over these, like a stone wall or something. But when you're actually down on the ice, these chunks, like this is probably like a four foot tall chunk of ice, but there's nothing for scale, like nothing at all for scale. You couldn't even tell how fast the ship was going because there's just nothing, there's nothing to look at to gauge it against. Um, this is the view from the bridge where they steer the ship from up at the top. And oh, and the other thing was the light. So again, 24 hour daylight, but the quality of the light would really change. So this was at about 3 a.m. I would get up sometimes just to look at the light. So the daytime light was really harsh and glary on the snow. The nighttime light was really beautiful and like this. Um, this is some more nighttime light. And it did get colder at night, even though the sun didn't really go down. When the light, when the sun got low toward the horizon, it would get colder. Most of the time that we were out there, it was between zero and freezing. So it would get up maybe close to freezing during the day and down close to zero at night outside. And the ship inside was heated to like normal room temperatures. And this is really about as dark as it ever got, like a, a deep twilight. And that would be around like midnight or 1 a.m. It would be like that. Um, and we were close to shore. We saw a lot of birds. These are kitty wakes. Amanda took this really good photo with her really good camera. And then we got a little further. We started seeing walrus and they were just piled up on these pieces of floating ice. Like big walrus piles which was amazing. So the first week of the cruise, I pretty much was just looking at wildlife. I couldn't focus on doing any work or anything, just by the rail looking at wildlife all the time. And I don't have a picture of it, but we actually saw a baby walrus, which was amazing. And like we were probably the first people in the world ever to see that particular walrus. So just, just kind of a mind blowing place to be. And we saw polar bears. And this gives you a sense of the scale of these pieces of ice, like they're bigger than polar bears. And again, they, most of them were not afraid of the ship. They would just sort of, they wouldn't come that close, but they would roam around near the ship. And we saw a mother with cubs, which was really, yeah, during the whole cruise, I just kept having this, I can't believe this is happening to me, like every day. I'm seeing a wild polar bear with babies. Um, and they look small, but they're humongous. We had a flock of snow buntings visit the ship and that guy was picking up crumbs somewhere on the deck. Those were really cute. And then after we got a certain amount into the ice, we really didn't see any more wildlife except polar bears. The walrus and the birds pretty much all disappeared because they need open water but we did still see polar bears for most of the trip. Um, inside the ship, it was very, it was a lot of beige aluminum and very military and kind of industrial and metal everything. So this was my cabin. Um, Amanda and I had the bunk beds and each cabin had like a, two desks and a sink in, in the bedroom and then shared a bathroom with the next cabin. So it was, it was very dorm-like, um, pretty intense separation of men and women, like separate hallways, and then even more intense separation of the science crew and the Coast Guard. There was a science lounge on the science deck that had like a TV and books and games and stuff. And then the crew lived on a completely separate deck of the ship and they had their own crew lounge and science party was not allowed to go there. Crew was really discouraged from hanging out too much on the science deck. Um, the officers had their own deck that nobody was allowed on and they had their own officers lounge, which maybe served food, never found out for sure. Uh, we all ate in the mess hall together but on separate sides. So there was the crew side and the science side. And it was just like any cafeteria, go through the line and get your food on a tray. Um, the food was good at first and then it got progressively worse and worse and worse 
as we kept going with no resupply and kept running out of first it was fresh vegetables and then it was eggs and then it was fresh milk and by the end it was a really pretty grim with the food um and this is bob pickard the chief scientist from hui that was the one that brought me on this cruise and I'll the a couple of all the oh sorry a couple of questions yeah let's do it uh, so, so speaking of, of diets, uh, what do the walruses eat? Oh, they eat benthic organisms. So stuff that's hanging out on the bottom on the seafloor, like crabs and shellfish and things like that. Uh, that's what they, they use their tusks to like scuffle up the mud and get stuff. Um, and then was it hard to sleep with the constant daylight? So there's one porthole in each room and it has a shutter that you can close. So it wasn't hard to sleep with the daylight, but it was hard to sleep at first with the, with the ice breaking, it's very vibrating. So everything's shaking all the time. And in the bunk bed, you're right next to the wall. So like if my foot touched the wall, the shaking of the ship would wake me up. So that, yeah, the noise and the vibration was worse than the light. And then uh, one more for Maggie. Um, which I was wondering as well. Um, why? What's the reason for this, such a strong separation between the crew and the scientists and Coast Guard? Um, because the Coast Guard crew is mostly young men, and the science party was m probably three quarters female grad students. And the Coast Guard really, really didn't want the crew hanging out with the grad students. Um, cool. And in fact, a couple of Coast Guard crew got in trouble for being. But just, you know, not romantically involved, but just too friendly with part of the people in the science party. Sit, you know, sitting too close was was not okay. I don't really know. It's the military. I think it's a military thing. But that was my impression was, yeah, making sure that there was no romance going on. Great, thanks. Yeah. No problem. Um, yeah, so these were these guys cooked all the food and did an amazing job. And everybody on the crew was super friendly and awesome. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like we weren't allowed to talk to them at all. We just couldn't really socialize. Um, and this was a shot of the lab. So a lot of time spent in the lab, which was really crowded because it was a very full ship. So little, little cubicles, people doing their analysis and lab work. Um, this is one of the things that he got in trouble for spending too much time in the lab reading to Sophie. But more, I had the slide just because this is where people spent their time. A lot of time down in the bottom of the ship in the lab. And then a lot of time spent out on the ice at ice stations and a lot of time carting all the stuff out onto the ice and bringing it back. And the Coast Guard were super helpful with that. They were really involved in a lot of the technical part of the science, just deploying instruments and moving things around. And when people weren't working, there was ping pong, which is really hard to play ping pong on a moving ship. This was in the Hilo hangar. So there's a helicopter hangar and a helicopter landing pad on the boat, but we didn't have a helicopter on our cruise. So it was just a big empty space. And you can see that the table is like strapped down with ratchet straps. Um, and Jenga, another hard thing to do on a ship. And this is a shot from above the helo hangar with ping pong going on at the same time as a yoga class. So trying to find things to do. And twice during the cruise, we had these ice liberty days. So free time on the ice when no experiments were happening. Everybody just got to go out on the ice and have a little break from being confined on the ship. And in this picture, I'm not sure if you can tell, but everyone's wearing stick on mustaches and I don't remember why. We had a graduation on the ship. There were two undergrads from Stanford who were missing their graduation. So the kitchen staff made them a cake and they had brought their caps and gowns and their advisor that was there gave them their diplomas. And that was pretty cool. And then there was a little bit of just on warm days kind of lounging. Oops. Uh oh, oh, don't. Okay, there we go. Yeah, just kind of lounging around. Um, 
yeah, so that was just just wanted to kind of give an overview of of life at sea. And then to get more into the science, or maybe should I pause, Sean? Are there more questions? This is a good pause point. Uh, you can go right ahead. Okay. Um, so the name of the cruise was Sub Ice, and it stood for a study of under ice blooms in the Chukchi ecosystem. And I really wonder how long scientists spend always making their acronyms spell something relevant, like Sub Ice for the under ice blooms but they seem always able to do that. And the goal was to study plankton colonies under the ice and try to determine what conditions cause these under ice blooms to happen and whether this is related to climate change or is just a naturally a, a phenomenon that's been occurring for a long time anyway. So plankton are all of the small free-floating marine life. So there are plant plankton called phytoplankton and animal plankton called zooplankton or zooplankton. And so they can be little one-celled algae, they can be diatoms, they can be little protozoans, or they can be bigger like small shrimp or larvae of barnacles, larvae of jellyfish. Those are all plankton at different life stages. So it's not like a specific species or even, it is a very broad category. And these are, so these shots are from the microscope on the ship. They had a camera set up with a microscope. So this is an animal plankton called a copepod. It's a little shrimp-like crustacean guy. These are barnacle larvae. They float freely until they settle on a surface and turn into what we think of as barnacles. And this is just a mixture. So these are more copepods. These are these little worms that are, for plankton, they're really big. You could see them just barely with the naked eye. These guys, they would look like a tiny little line. And the sort of cycle of the plankton in the Arctic is that in the spring, the Arctic switches really rapidly from 24 hour dark to 24 hour daylight. So as that happens, as the sun rises for the first time of the year and gets higher and higher in the sky, the snow on the ice starts to melt, the ice starts to melt back, um, ice algae start to grow underneath the ice. And then as the ice breaks up completely and open water is exposed to the sun, then there's this explosion of phytoplankton, plant plankton growing in the water, not on the bottom of the ice. And that phytoplankton bloom feeds the zooplankton so there's just this huge explosion of life, microscopic life in the water that keeps going basically until the sun starts to set and the ice starts to come in again. But it really, well, that's not really true. In this diagram it does, but it actually drops off much quicker than that. Their life cycles are pretty short. And the plankton are really the foundation of the Arctic food web. So this is not the best diagram but this is supposed to represent the phytoplankton, which are eaten by the zooplankton. These are those little copepods. And then just about everything eats the zooplankton. Um, small fish, larvae of other animals, birds, baleen whales eat a lot of krill and other crustacean plankton. Um, and then seals and birds eat the fish, toothed whales eat the fish orcas and polar bears eat the seals. And then over here, you kind of see the walrus part that someone was asking about the walruses eating lobsters and crabs and things from the bottom, which are also feeding on plankton, dead plankton that are falling to the ocean floor. So the phytoplankton are really, they're taking the place of the plants in a terrestrial system. They're the link between the sun and the animals because there aren't, in this Arctic marine system, there really aren't any other plants. So without the phytoplankton, the whole food web would completely collapse. So that's why they're important and we wanted to investigate more what was going on. So the, the traditional thinking was, was this, the plankton don't bloom until the ice is gone and the sun is hitting the water. But in 2010, the Healy was in the Chukchi Sea, and this is not what they were looking for. They were there to study something completely different. This is what 
normally under the ice, no plankton, clear water, what everybody assumed was going on all the time. This is what they found in 2010 was this intense pea soup plankton bloom of phytoplankton under the ice turning the water green and this had never been seen before. So this was a, a totally new discovery and the purpose of the sub ice cruise was to come back and investigate. It took them four years to get a grant and get sea time to come back and investigate what was going on here and what were the conditions that were causing it to happen. And there were two hypotheses. One is that this was just going on all the time and nobody was there to see it. So we didn't know about it. It's really remote. What are the chances that someone would be in the right place at the right time with the right equipment? And two, this is a climate change impact. So thinner ice, more first year ice and less multi-year ice, less snow on top of the ice, more melt ponds on top of the ice. All of those could be letting more sunlight through than in the past. And that could be allowing these under ice blooms to happen before the ice has totally melted back. So that was sort of the big question. Is this something that's always been going on or is this a new thing? So we needed to get far north ahead of the plankton blooms to measure the conditions before, during, and after any blooms to try to figure out what conditions were triggering it, how much light they needed, what kind of water chemistry and nutrients were needed to start a bloom, all of those kinds of things. So there were three to, to kind of match these through, sorry, I keep going forward, I'm gonna go back match this, the water chemistry, the light, and the biological activity, there were three science teams. And these three, these are the three chief scientists, and this is OPS, the, the Coast Guard Operations Officer who interfaced with the science team. And each of these teams was investigating one of those things. This is Bob Pickart from Huey again, and he was the physical oceanographer doing water chemistry and nutrients and currents. This is Chris from the Cold Regions Research Lab, Chris Pol um, Polanski, Pol I think so. Um, and he was doing the ice physics, how much light is going through the ice, um, how thick the ice is, how porous it is. And then this is Kevin Arrigo from Stanford and he was doing the biology. And each of them brought a pretty good sized team with them. So Bob and the physical oceanographers were mostly lowering instruments over the side of the ship. They never went out at the ice stations. They were using an instrument called a CTD, which stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth to measure the salinity and water temperature at different depths in the water column, and then also collecting water samples to measure the oxygen, the nutrients, and all of this was to mostly to help track currents and try to figure out where the water is going. So this is the CTD and the Coast Guard were the ones that actually deployed it. Um, and they did this every four hours around the clock for almost the whole cruise, put it over the side and these bottles, so there are sensors on the bottom taking measurements and the bottles are collecting water samples. And when the CTD would come back up, there was kind of this mad dash for everybody to get their samples for their tests that they had to run. Um, and one of the so one of the reasons why these things like salinity are important is because when the ice is freezing, the so the ice is fresh water on top of the salt water, and the freezing process extrudes the salt out of the ice, so it makes a layer of freshwater ice and then a layer of really salty water underneath it, and then that really salty water sinks down to the bottom because it's more dense, where it picks up a lot of nutrients and gets this kind of signature winter water chemical profile of really salty, really cold, and really high nutrients. So what they were trying to do was track, track this winter water and see how it's circulating and at what point the less dense, less salty, nutrient-poor summer water starts to come in from the Bering Sea and how that impacted when the plankton blooms happened. Oh, and this is, a, after the mad dash, 
to get the water samples, then there was kind of another mad dash to look at the data coming in. Everybody crowding around the computer. And then the ice physics team were the ones that were mostly going out on the ice. They were keeping a log of ice conditions from the bridge every hour around the clock, but then they were also going out at these ice stations um, measuring the snow depth, the ice thickness, how much light is bouncing off the snow versus being absorbed by the snow and ice versus actually getting through to the water, and then also doing um, water permeability experiments on the ice. So they had all of this crazy optical equipment that they were taking measurements with. That's me in the polar bear hat, which I had to buy in Dutch Harbor when my luggage was lost at the one store there. And so they would walk these long transects at each ice station taking, so I was taking snow depth. This I think is measuring light bounced off of the snow and she's measuring has a probe measuring light that's making it through to the water. That's another one in, in the melt pond. And then this is the permeability experiments. They're drilling holes, taking cores, and putting, so with the permeability, the idea was that, so these freshwater melt ponds stay on top of the ice, but if you drill a hole in the ice, it fills in with salt water like right up to the surface immediately. So is it porous or is it not porous? Like how is it holding water but not holding water at the same time? So they were trying to figure that out. And here he's making the water really, really cold by mixing snow into these buckets of fresh water using some not very high tech equipment. And I'm helping again. Um, and pouring the fresh water in to see what happens when you pour fresh versus salt water in the holes and why does the ice seem permeable to salt water but not to fresh water. And the, the kind of question behind the optical stuff was how really driven by how much light is getting through that could be used for photosynthesis by the plankton and all the measurements with the snow on top are because white surfaces reflect more light than dark surfaces. And the number for that is called the albedo. But so as the snow melts back, sn fresh snow reflects about 85% of light. And old snow or bare ice reflects less and open water reflects much, much less, even though we still think of water as fairly reflective, it's much less reflective than fresh snow. So it's a positive feedback loop where as it starts to melt, it starts to absorb more light, which makes it melt faster, which makes it absorb more light as the surface color darkens and it, it speeds up, which is part of the problem with climate change in the Arctic. So that's why they were taking all of these albedo measurements about reflectivity and trying to figure out at what point the cascade really starts that lets enough light through and how much light is enough for plankton. And then the biologists were doing so much that I had to split it up between phytoplankton and zooplankton. They were taking ice cores and analyzing ice algae, measuring chlorophyll in the water and using that as a proxy for phytoplankton activity, uh, incubating water samples in the lab and measuring phytoplankton grazing rates, and then using and imaging this crazy camera machine called the Imaging Flow Cytobot that they put water samples in and every time a cell with chlorophyll in it passes a sensor as the water is moving through the machine, it triggers a camera that takes a picture of the cell and then they can use those to categorize species instead of someone having to look through the microscope 24-7. It's an easier, quicker way to do it. So that was the ice core cutting and they put them in coolers and took them back into the ship and then a lot of lab work with the phytoplankton. And these are the images that come from the imaging flow cytobot of the different kinds of, of um, phytoplankton. This is called Thalassiocyra and this is Nietzschea 
and this I think is a mixture of the two and maybe another one called Fragilariopsis. I am not, my plankton ID from the grainy black photos is not as good as theirs. And then for the zooplankton, they were using nets, both hand nets at ice stations, dip nets through holes in the ice, and then also these nets called bongo nets that they would drag behind the ship between stations to capture zooplankton. And they would also lower a camera net overboard that didn't actually bring anything up. The net just sort of funneled plankton past a camera that would take pictures that they would then later use to categorize where the plankton were in the water column. Because when you net them up and just bring up a whole bunch, you're mixing together the things that are really deep and the things that are just hanging out at the surface. So the Loki was solving that problem by taking like depth stamped photos all the way up to see where the different things were hanging out. And then they were also just doing some old fashioned looking through microscopes at plankton. So this is a hand net out on the ice, categorizing plankton in these little drink coolers. Oh, and this was, there was actually a fourth team that was not kind of part of the core mission. It was this team from the Takuvik Laboratory at University Laval in Quebec. And they kind of joined on at the very last minute because something went wrong with their plans to go out on a Canadian icebreaker. So that's why it was crowded. And they were kind of doing very similar work, but not part of the same core project, doing a similar thing on their own. Uh, these are the bongo nets that bring up all the plankton and the Coast Guard was lowering them off the stern called the fantail. Looking through the microscope. And then as far as what they found out, so we didn't actually see any under ice plankton blooms, which was disappointing. Um, these cruises have to be planned years in advance and you can't really predict the conditions. So we didn't find it, we were too early. I mean, it's a good thing for the state of the world, but the ice was not melting as fast and as early as they had expected. So we didn't, we never found them. But they still got a ton of data. It was the most comprehensive um, water chemistry survey of the Chuck GC ever done. They had tons of new current data, uh, new information about light transmission through the sea ice, light absorption. Um, found out that one of the things that needs to happen for these plankton blooms is that the ice has to stop actively freezing and start melting, which is what didn't happen. It wasn't warm enough. So it's not just the light, but also the temperature. And then the ice permeability thing about how the freshwater melt ponds sit on top of the ice turned out to be because, so freshwater has a higher freezing point than saltwater, right? Freshwater freezes at 32 and saltwater freezes at a colder temperature. So the fresh water hitting the ice was freezing in the pores of the ice really quickly and, and blocking the pores of the ice and then that would hold the rest of the fresh water. Whereas the salt water wasn't freezing as quickly and it would drain through, which is why holes would fill up with salt water. So they did learn some things even though not quite what they were hoping for. Um, is this is kind of another good pause point. Are there more questions, Sean? I'll see a couple. Yeah, Maggie's wondering um, just if you know the range of the ocean depths that was in the study area. Ooh, that's a good question. I know the Chuck GC is considered shallow, but I could not put a number on it. But it is, it is a shallow sea as seas go. I have to look that one up. Um, and then, so, so how is this expedition funded? Is it, is it that every lab is paying its own way with a certain price tag to be able to do their research on the ship or, or who's paying for it all? Yeah, so the three main science teams, Stanford, Woods Hole, and the Army Corps of Engineers Cold Regions Lab were all funded by one NSF grant. And I don't know the details of how that grant was divided up, but the, the grant, part of the grant was to pay for sea time. And sea time is absurdly expensive, like tens of thousands of dollars a day to be on a ship like this. So 
a lot, a lot of money went into this expedition and it mostly came from the NSF. And as far as the Canadians, I'm not sure if maybe their Canadian grant paid after they couldn't go on their Canadian icebreaker. I don't really know how science is funded in Canada and how international collaborations work. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, and I was not, for what it's worth, I was not getting paid, but I had all my expenses paid and I had a budget for materials. I, my flights were paid for, my meals were paid for, so it didn't cost me anything. I got a lot of good art materials that I would not have had an excuse to buy otherwise, and I got this experience of a lifetime. And I got all the originals and all the rights to all of my work. So that was huge. Um, and so the outreach team, there were actually six of us on the outreach team, five that were part of the Woods Hole Oceanographic team and one from Stanford. This is Ben, my roommate Amanda, and I. And Ben was the outreach coordinator and he also did some audio video stuff and he was in charge of all the logistics of the outreach team and he's the one that ran the Arctic Spring website. So that was a fairly big job. And then, oh, and Ben works for Hui. That's his full time gig is working for the Woods Hole Oceanographic. And then Amanda was a, the photographer and she's from New Hampshire. Um, she's my roommate. So I took a couple of random pictures of her. And she was, yeah, the official expedition photographer taking photos for the website, taking photos that the researchers could use later in papers or on their institution websites or, or whatever. And I'm pretty sure that the institutions got all of her photos. She got paid, but she did not get the rights to her photos. So it's kind of the flip side of my arrangement. And this is Amanda and Ben on the ice doing a little video about one of these grad students, Kate. There was Dallas Murphy, who's the one in front here, and he's a writer from New York City. He wrote the written dispatches on the Arctic Spring site, and he also wrote a couple of articles that got published in magazines, which what magaz I, I want to say in the Atlantic, but I might, I might be misremembering that. And he has a book that he wrote about another of Bob's expeditions that he went on. That one was to Greenland. And that was actually where I met Bob was because I was at the book talk. Bob and Dallas gave a book talk for this book. And that was, that was where that connection happened. And Jody is a dancer from New York City. And she was kind of an add-on where a friend of Bob's was like, you really got to take this dancer. And, and Bob was a little like, mm, I don't know. A, a lot of people were, were kind of reluctant about bringing a dancer. But in the end, she was the one whose work actually, I think, reached the most people. Because so she, she was, this is her practicing on the Hilo deck, but she would dance on the ice and she made a a pretty highly produced video that Ben recorded of her dancing on the ice. And then she went back to New York City and choreographed a dance routine for a big dance company and had some major performances and got actually a lot of publicity around Arctic ice and climate change and melting ice. So actually, I think it was a great decision to bring her. She's the one who probably brought the most press to the expedition unexpectedly. And then Jan was the one member of the outreach team from Stanford. She's an elementary school teacher that was somehow connected with the Stanford team. I couldn't find a picture of her. So instead I have pictures that I made for her. She did like a blog for kids on the website. She would post these little articles for kids and do question and answer. So kids from all over the world would send in questions and she would answer them. And this was to help illustrate how the icebreaker breaks ice. It has to come straight at it, not along the side. So she was doing that. And then I was there as a visual artist. And you might be wondering why, you know, why bring this huge outreach team? This is not normal. Um, this was a pretty historically large, an involved in multimedia outreach effort. 
So most NSF grants, which is how this cruise was funded, have this greater impacts clause about how are you going to take this science out of the lab, out of the scientific journal, and have some kind of impact in the world and, and get it out there. And a lot of scientists are kind of rolling their eyes at that and they'll like write an article that maybe gets published in somewhere or give an interview to a local news or radio station or make some little YouTube video or something, but kind of try to do the bare minimum to fulfill this greater impacts clause. But Bob has really gotten into the outreach and this is probably the biggest outreach team of his career to date, but he's brought Dallas on previous expeditions. He brought Amanda on another one after this one. Um, ben does a lot of work with him. So he really believes in the power of the arts to communicate science, and he sees that as a big part of his legacy as a lead scientist at Hui is his out outreach efforts. And this is just a quote from him about how artists can just get people thinking in different ways about the Arctic. So that brings us to kind of my, my approach, which was to put my face right in the melt ponds and drink out of the melt ponds. But, but really though, I, my approach was to just get right in there as involved with the science as I possibly could. Um, the scientists use the time at sea for data collection like kind of a mad dash to collect as much information as they can while they have the chance and then they analyze and process and write later back on shore. So I approached it in kind of a similar way that this was my chance to really learn and experience and take photos and collect images and develop ideas and then I would make the more polished work back at home. So I did a lot of helping with data collection because that was sort of my, my best access to the scientists. I had a lot of questions and I was able to have this kind of informal access to them that way rather than trying to get them to sit down with me and talk to me. And nobody else on the outreach team really did that. And I'm not sure if it was because they didn't want to go out on the ice and be cold or it just wasn't part of their process or, or what. But that was... A big part of how I approached it was was just getting in there and doing data collection. So this is that mixing the, the snow into the water to make it cold. Here I'm just keeping tension on this cord while he's doing something with one of the water chemistry instruments. Um, and I also went out with the physics team and took some snow depth measurements. And then I had my little workspace in what was they called this room was called the future lab because I guess since the ship had been built, it, the, the idea was to make this in the future, it will be a second lab, but it wasn't. So I had this workspace in the future lab that I could set up my stuff and draw. Um, and I, I would kind of split my time between like being, being out on the ice on ice days, watching wildlife from the bridge, talking to the scientists, absorbing as much as I could, and then making drawings and taking notes and writing and reflecting. And I made daily drawings for the website. So tried tried to make at least something, something semi-presentable every day to post on the website to kind of generate interest and keep the content going there but I was also just doing a lot of developing ideas. Um, and that's kind of how I tend to approach my work anyway, is sort of a long period of research and sketching and ideas. So it was a, it was a good fit for my natural way of working to have this like data collection period and then to go back and finish the work. Um, and that's a close up of this walrus drawing. Just kind of, working out ideas. Um, and this is another view of the future lab. I would also often spend a lot of time drawing in this little space. So this was the main console on the bridge. They were, so right behind that, somebody's steering the boat. And then these are, this is this bank of floor to ceiling windows. So I found this little spot where I just could squeeze in there and be out of the way. And I spent a lot of time working 
in that spot as well when I was not out doing science. And I thought I would just kind of walk through that process of going from like really rough sketchbook pages to more finished work. So these are the, the really rough, like taking a lot of notes, working out ideas, and these are different people that I was talking to, like Joanie from the Quebecois team, and you know, plankton at different depths in the water column. And just different plankton and ideas of what I might do with them. Researching whales making notes about like even though this is a pretty rough drawing of a polar bear like the nose and ears are much bigger than the eyes this this bear was whiter than previous bears that we had seen a lot of the bears were really yellow they're like really dirty um, so just making these these rough sketches and then going towards the more like the middle part of the process are these more finished drawings so like the sketchbook pages would take a few minutes one of these drawings might take a couple of hours like I would make one of these a day usually for the for the blog and this is just the ice skate so I I focused on the science a lot with my drawings but I also did some drawings of the scenery and the wildlife partly because I was really attracted to it and partly because everybody wants to see polar bears like that's how you kind of draw people in and get them interested and then start showing them plankton so these were some of the drawings from the bridge and I made these by toning the whole sheet gray and then I erased out the ice. Some walrus. That's that same drawing again. Another walrus. These were those little snow buntings that were on the deck at the beginning of the cruise. A couple close-ups of them. And then these are some of the plankton. So this is an ice algae called Nietzsche. Uh, another kind of phytoplankton called Chytoceros. Another one, this is a diatom called, um, I'm not super good at pronouncing, Asterionelopsis, I believe. Uh, Melosyra, which is also a freshwater one. The UVM research vessel is called the Melosyra, and it's in the lake here as well. It's a chain-forming algae. And a close-up of that. So these were the, the drawings that were being posted on the website. The sketchbook pages did not get posted. These were what was getting posted all the time on the official website. This is a, an animal plankton, little, little snail-like guys. Oh, and then, okay. Yeah, so that is kind of the, the end of the shipboard drawings. I had more, but I don't have good photos of all of them. And then the third phase is going back to shore and making the finished, you know, art show display quality, portfolio quality work, which got put on hold for me because I then went to grad school at UVM. So I actually have just been picking that thread back up in the last year or so. I, when I came on the ship I had some ideas about plankton I had done some research I had some ideas what I might want to do and then over the time at sea I developed them into kind of two ideas for bodies of work that I then kind of put down and have now picked back up so one of them is these prints and these are three of my four blocks of a polar bear a walrus I hadn't yet carved out the tusks but I, I later did and a bowhead whale and this is some color palette research I was doing. And then these are some of the first layers of prints. So I was working at Burlington City Arts up until this pandemic, and I finished the first layer of each print, which is the silhouette. So there's the bear, the walrus, and the whale. These are obviously not very good photos because it's in process work. And then I didn't have any good pictures of the fox, but there's the little fox drawing as the fourth animal, the Arctic fox. We never saw Arctic foxes, but we saw their tracks all the time. They're just very shy and they're very white, so you can't really see them on the ice. And they follow the polar bears and scavenge from the polar bear kills on the ice. And then a shot of pulling up the print 
So for anybody that doesn't know, the way this works is that I would roll ink with a roller onto the wood and then put a piece of paper on top of the inked wood and roll it through a printing press. And this is that moment of lifting the paper off of the block and seeing if it came out well. So my plan with these is I printed these big solid color silhouettes of these top of the food chain, big charismatic megafauna. And I'm gonna then print over them line drawings of patterns made up of plankton. So I have just some little sketches of some of the patterns working that out. And taking inspiration from a lot of Scandinavian art that has animal drawings. I don't know if anyone has seen them with where there are a lot of like patterned collars or cuffs on the animals, patterns within the animals. And then a lot of Canadian and Alaskan indigenous clothing has like embroidered patterns, not, not as much um, with recognizable figurative elements as the Scandinavian ones. Those are mostly geometric but taking some inspiration from those to make patterns made out of plankton on these animals, kind of visually showing how the top of the food chain is really made up of these plankton, um, while trying to walk a fine line of not doing cultural appropriation. So I'm, I'm working on how exactly to navigate that. And then the other idea I had was to make a wall installation that's a graph of a plankton bloom. So the vertical axis would be depth, the top of the wall would be the surface of the ocean and the, the bottom by the floor would be the ocean floor and horizontally would be time. And I could show how the plankton bloom evolves over time from just a few individual plankton of a few species to just dense, dense multi-species plankton bloom. And so I've been experimenting with different ways to make these plankton. I really want to show them in a circle, like as they would be seen through a microscope or through a porthole. That's kind of, those are sort of our windows to the ocean tend to be round. So these are watercolor and colored pencil drawings on clear vellum. And I had this thought, maybe I could illuminate them from the back somehow. Haven't quite figured it out. Another thought was maybe scratch boards. So these are round scratch boards, very hard to cut perfectly round. I would have to get better at that. And then I also tried some fiber stuff, which I wasn't super happy with how that came out. So and next I'm gonna try silk screen. So that one is still, still kind of in development. And I think that is pretty much it. Um, oh yeah, I did a little workshop in linoleum printing on the cruise for the crew and science party. So that was kind of a fun, fun activity. Um, yeah, and here are some of the, the links if you wanna check it out. Um, thank you as always to Bob Pickart for this experience. And then I just wanna give photo credit to Amanda. Several of the photos were from her. And then there were a couple from Pierre Coupel who was part of the Takivik Quebec group. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chelsea. Uh, we have a couple questions for you if you have the time. Yeah, of course. Uh, well, one is actually from Leslie Parr. You're going to have a show of your work in the Arctic once it's uh, once it's all done, and I will um, just uh, also take the opportunity to extend an invitation to you to uh, to show your work at the Nature Center once once such things become socially acceptable again. I would love that. Yes, that is the hope to have a show, but I don't have any venue or date booked. So I would love to do it at the Nature Center and wherever else we'll have it. Cool. A um, couple other questions. Oh, uh, Maggie's wondering, did you go into the expedition with an idea of what you would draw and focus on? And, uh, or did you figure it out as you went? And did the science request any specific pieces? So for the first one, I had some ideas. I had gotten a book on plankton. I'd been doing some reading. I knew that I wanted to focus mostly on the plankton more than on the ice optics or the physical oceanography, which I think maybe made those teams a little bit sad. Um, but the plankton are just so much more visually beautiful. So I, I kind of had that idea and I had some rough ideas, but I also was really focused on being open to what happened and really getting involved with the science and experiencing it 
and letting the art develop as I learned more about the science and on board came up with those two ideas for the two bodies of work. And then as far as requesting anything specific, not in terms of my big finished work, but there were some small things like those little illustrations of how the ship breaks ice that people would sometimes come ask me to make some small thing or like one guy fell down a gangway and broke his ribs and they asked me to draw him a walrus get well card. Oh, that's funny. Um, let's see, Maggie's, uh, Maggie's wondering, um, oh, I've also mentioned, yeah, if anybody else has any additional questions, now is a good time to throw them into the, uh, the group chat here before we finish things up. Uh, Maggie's wondering how you got interested in the UVM field naturalist program and perhaps the connection between the, the expedition and that program. Yeah, so Rosemary Mosco is an alumni of the UVM field naturalist program and she has a web comic called Bird and Moon which is really good and you should all follow it. I think it's just birdandmoon.com and it's it's a science web comic. It's about science and nature and she does these really beautiful drawings and so I had stumbled on that and gotten excited about another artist who was into science and was doing the art science combo thing and somehow by clicking links through her website, I got to like her profile and it said that she had gone to this UVM field naturalist program and linked to that. And when I opened up that web page as it was like, I had not been considering going to grad school, but it just seemed like it was written for me, this combination of science and communication and reading the landscape and telling the story so that was really, it came from a webcomic about what to do when you find a baby bird. Um, what's the, what's, what's one piece about either, um, either scientific art or, or artists or the Arctic that is just like a big misconception that uh, you want to take this opportunity to debunk? Ooh, that's a good one. I would say the idea that artists have this like divine inspiration moment and run to their easel and make a painting because that has never happened to me and it doesn't happen to any of the artists I know and for me the process is really a lot more like science. I spend weeks reading and researching and kind of spinning these ideas around in my head and making little sketches and making studies and taking a long time to work up to the finished thing which is also often kind of materially technical. So, so there might be painters out there that have that experience, but I think that's a common one that people think it just comes to artists fully formed. And for me, that's not the case. It's a long process of, of problem, visual problem solving and material problem solving to get there. All right, well, um, I'm just checking the group chat here to see if anybody else has any additional questions. Um, folks are welcome to uh, turn your mics on, your cameras on if you want to chat and say hi and, and hang out for a little bit. But um, otherwise, just want to say thanks so much to, uh, to Chelsea for sharing your wisdom and your, your voyage with us. Um, thanks to everybody out there for supporting North Branch Nature Center. Um, I'd be remiss not to uh, invite you to contribute to our resiliency fund if you like what we're producing. I also would be remiss not to uh, tell you to go to chelseaclark.com. That's Clark with an E on the end. Um, chelseaclark.com to uh, see um, all sorts of wonderful work. Um, Arctic, oh, arcticspring.org, is Arctic that right? Arcticspring.org, yep, is the official one. And then my personal blog was on that last slide is Arctic art here. I'll, I will, it's long. I will type it in the chat. There. And I hope that I got that. Correct. Arctic art and science.blogspot.com rolls right off the tongue. I know. This is not a, it's hard to get a blogspot address actually that has like, yeah. I wanted artist in the Arctic but it was taken and the person, even though they hadn't used it in five years, would not give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thanks again, Chelsea. Really appreciate it. And, yeah, thank uh, you so much for having me. Once, once all the, uh, once some, some more of the work coalesces in the next you know, year or two here, we'll be happy to, 
to put it on the walls up at the Nature Center for a while and invite you to, to do all this again in person. Yeah, I would be honored. Yeah, thank you.